Perhaps I could encourage you to squeeze into the middle, fill in some of those seats. If you're next to an empty seat or two, nice to see the room filling up this evening. And we are delighted that all of you are here. So let me give you just a moment to get settled. Maybe if you have a seat close to you or next to you that is free, that's, that's, maybe you could just slip your hand up and uh, some of those who are in the back could see those raised hands. Keep those hands up just for a moment. If you see a raised hand, saints, it means there's an empty seat or two by that raised hand. So uh, please take advantage of that. There are some seats right down here in the front row that are available, right by Dr. Cushman, uh, chair of the board, Max Torkelson. These are prime seats. Again, please accept my thanks for your presence here with us this evening. Walla Walla University boasts of uh, many excellent professors, one of whom will speak to us this evening. Those of us who work here at Walla Walla University regularly see these well-educated colleagues who are passionate about their academic disciplines. We see them at the water cooler. We see them in the committee room. We see them at Andes and Walmart and Valley Vision and so on. However, unless we are bright enough to be Walla Walla University students or to take advantage of the employee benefit of a free class, we rarely have access to why Walla Walla University pays these colleagues such fabulous salaries and why students pay good money to be taught and mentored by them. The distinguished faculty lecture gives us a chance once a year to break this sad cycle, to listen carefully and deeply to one of these amazing people that we too often take for granted. And it gives us the chance to do what any self-respecting university community ought to do on a cool and rainy fall evening. That is, think together about important themes with the help of a treasured friend and an able guide. Again, Thank you very much for being here this evening. Our prayer will be given to us, will be presented on our behalf, I should say, by Max Torkelson, the second chair of the board. Would you stand, please, with bowed heads? Father in heaven, we thank you this evening that here in this faith-based institution, we have the opportunity to celebrate academic excellence. We're thankful that these two values are not contradictory. We can be both faithful believers and excellent students. We pray that you'll bless Dr. Bond as she presents this topic. Give her focus and special ability to communicate, to communicate her thoughts to us, and may we be challenged with new thoughts and understandings about this world in which we live. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. The number of you who have shown up this evening, I think, illustrates just how well our speaker this evening is loved and appreciated. And when we inquired of Dr. Bond who she would like to have introduce her, she mentioned my name. So let me give it my best shot. It is my pleasure this evening to tell you about our distinguished faculty lecturer, Dr. Kelly Bond. 
This introduction is both professional and personal because that reflects the influence that tonight's speaker has on her colleagues and her students. As we begin, I'd like to share a few comments from one of her students and her colleagues that describe Dr. Bond's impact on their lives. This from one of Dr. Bond's students. I wish there were words to describe how amazing she is at the things she does. Her knowledge is obvious and overwhelming. I should mention that this was in a student evaluation, by the way. Her energy is contagious, and her kindness is awe-inspiring. I left class every day feeling smarter. I would wish that for all of you who are students who take classes here. And finally, this student closes by saying, Walla Walla could use more teachers like Dr. Bond. And then, from several of her colleagues, Kelly maintains rigorous classes while earning students' respect and appreciation, as you just heard. She exudes a contagious enthusiasm and passion in her interactions with students and colleagues alike. Kelly exhibits an insatiable curiosity that is both refreshing and inspiring. So just who is Dr. Kelly Bond? She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from a prestigious university in College Place, Washington, also known as Walla Walla University. Yes, she is one of our own. She earned both a Master of Arts degree in English and a doctorate in English from the University of Oregon. As part of the Walla Walla University learning community, Dr. Bond began teaching in the English department in 2004 and is currently chair of that department. She was recognized for her outstanding contributions in the classroom in 2010 with the Walla Walla University Presidential Award for Excellence in Teaching and for her contributions to students outside the classroom with the Walla Walla University Excellence in Advising Award in 2011. Her ongoing annual evaluations in both of those areas reflect a high level of competence and compassion. It is the transformative influence of Dr. Bond's interactions with students and colleagues alike that makes her contributions here special and why she is loved and respected by all of us who know here, her here at Walla Walla University. It is my distinct privilege this evening to introduce to you our 2015 Distinguished Faculty Lecturer, Dr. Kelly Bond. The title of her presentation, Outside and Insider Society, Virginia Woolf, James Baldwin and Resistance to Power. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bond. Thank you, Bob. And thank all of you for joining us here this evening. I want to welcome our administrators, our board of trustees, our faculty, our staff, our wonderful students, and our alumni and community members who are joining us here in this room and also online via our website. I specifically want to thank the Faculty Development Committee for giving me this opportunity, my colleagues in the English department and the history departments who are wonderful conversationalists and a constant support, my students who work hard and who are delight to teach, my immediate and extended family who have taught me to love many things, especially them and cats, <laughs> and my husband Paul Johnson who has heard too many sentences lately and who has designed my keynote presentation. As most of you know, I typically just write on the blackboard. Thank you. I'm taking the opportunity this evening to consider four literary texts that address with some urgency the problem of inequality. I keep thinking about these texts and I keep asking you if you've read them. Many of my students have read one or two of them because I assign them frequently, but this evening I want to bring them into our conversation widely and I want to read them together. These authors, Virginia Woolf, and James Baldwin were both seminal writers during eras of radical change. 
Wolf was a major figure in the literary revolution of modernism during the first half of the 20th, 20th century, and Baldwin was a major figure in the civil rights movement in America. Wolf spent her life in London, where she grew up in a prominent literary household. Her mother came from a family of publishers, and her father was a critic, a philosopher, and a biographer. In 1917, she and her husband, Leonard Wolf, established the Hogarth Press, which published works by many of the era's leading writers. Although Wolf received an excellent education at home, she lamented her inability to attend the country's best universities, Oxford and Cambridge, which did not grant women full admittance until the 1970s. Baldwin grew up in Harlem, the oldest of nine children and a son of a preacher. In 1948, he moved to France, which he deemed a refuge far from American madness. But he kept his US citizenship and claimed his American identity. Using their insights as outsiders, Wolf and Baldwin challenge inequality by exposing the devastating effects of patriarchy and white supremacy, respectively, and by helping us better understand the experiences of the disempowered. In her book-length essay, Three Guineas, published in 1938, Virginia Woolf uses impending war as an opportunity to promote gender equality. The ostensible impetus for her epistle, she writes the essay in the form of a letter, is the request by a man to join and subscribe to a society for preventing war. In short, and I say this facetiously because the letter is long, she refuses to join his society because she can leave, believes that she can help more by staying outside. With the world on the brink of yet another war, she doubts men's track record. Acknowledging that men's attempts to broker peace usually end in violence, she observes sarcastically, you, of course, could once more take up arms in Spain as before in France in defense of peace. Women, even if they wanted to, could not join men in combat. And she points out the irony of men asking women to help prevent war when they simultaneously bar women from full participation in society. Rhetoric apart, she asks, what active method is open to us? The active method that Wolf chooses herself, of course, is rhetoric. For her, writing is a political profession. In fact, she believes women can greatly assist society by questioning its assumptions and traditions. But to help, women must speak their minds, and they can speak their minds only if they have their own money. Without their own money, she argues, they will consciously or unconsciously adopt the ideas of the men on whom they depend financially. With her own money, however, a woman need no longer use her charm to procure it from her father or brother. Since it is beyond the power of her family to punish her financially, she can express her own opinions. In short, she need not acquiesce, she can criticize. At last, she is in possession of an influence that is, in, that is disinterested. And criticize, Wolf does. Women see the world through different eyes, she argues, because they have been confined mostly to the private world of the home. When they look at the public world, the world of professions and politics, they thus see men differently than men see themselves. Women's perspective can help, she argues, and she directs men to see the world from women's point of view. Let us then, she says, by way of a very elementary beginning, lay before you a photograph, a crudely colored photograph of your world as it appears to us from the threshold of the private home, through the shadow of the veil St. Paul still lays upon our eyes, from the bridge which connects the private house with the world of public life. From this imagined bridge, Wolf watches the procession of men below, and what she sees is a society trained to fight. Wearing their badges of rank, men reveal their drive to establish hierarchies, to show themselves as better than others, Every rank advertised by their clothing, she argues, suggests their competitive nature. Your clothes, in the first place, make us gape with astonishment. How many, how splendid, how extremely ornate they are, the clothes worn by the educated man in his public capacity. Now you dress in violet, a jeweled crucifix swings on your breast. 
Now your shoulders are covered with lace, now furred with ermine, now slung with many linked chains set with precious stones. Now you wear wigs on your heads. Rows of graduated curls descend to your necks. Now your hats are boat-shaped or cocked. Now they mount in cones of black fur. Now they are made of brass and scuttle shape. Now plumes of red, now of blue hair surmount them. Sometimes gowns cover your legs, sometimes gaiters. Tabards embroidered with lions and unicorns swing from your shoulders. Metal objects cut in star shapes or in circles glitter and twinkle upon your breasts. Ribbons of all colors, blue, purple, crimson, cross from shoulder to shoulder. After the comparative simplicity of your dress at home, the splendor of your public attire is dazzling. She offers these photographs to demonstrate her point. Mm -hmm. And here are the college professors. <laughs> Wolf's long catalog of men's decorations illustrates their endless show of power, and she resists this power by mocking the spectacle. From where she stands, she sees that every gradation of rank indicates the competitive attitude that inevitably leads to war. We can say that for educated men to emphasize their superiority over other people, either in birth or intellect, by dressing differently or by adding titles before or letters after their names are acts that rouse competition and jealousy. Emotions which, as we need scarcely draw upon biography to prove, nor ask psychology to show, have their share in encouraging a disposition towards war. To begin addressing the problem of men's propensity for, to war, Wolf turns first to the issue of women's education. Next to the letter from the man asking her to join a society preventing war, Wolf places a letter from a woman requesting money to rebuild a women's college. She decides to give her money to this college rather than to the man's society because she believes women's education will help women speak their minds and because she believes the new college can be designed to resist hierarchies, competition, and jealousy. But she won't give her money unless the school agrees to her terms. Now, she says, since history and biography, the only evidence available to an outsider seem to prove that the old education of the old colleges breeds neither particular respect for liberty nor a particular hatred of war, it is clear that you must build your college differently. She calls for a curriculum that unifies rather than divides. The aim for the new college, the cheap college, she insists, should be not to segregate and to specialize, but to combine. It should explore the ways in which mind and body can be made to cooperate, discover what new combinations make good holes in human life. But as soon as she imagines a new kind of school, she also recognizes the difficulty of rebuilding it along new lines. After all, if women are to pay enough money to be at liberty to speak their own minds, they will have to enter the marketplace and compete with men. She acknowledges this dilemma. Students must be taught to earn their livings, and since that reality meant that women must rebuild their college on the same lines as others, it followed that the college for the daughters of educated men must also make research produce practical results, which will induce bequests and donations from rich men. It must encourage competition. It must accept degrees in colored hoods. It must accumulate great wealth. It must exclude other people from a share of its wealth. And therefore, in 500 years or so, that college, too, must ask the same question that you, sir, are asking now. How, in your opinion, are we to prevent war? But though she recognizes this dilemma, she does not despair. With a woman's college, she argues, the world will be a better place, even if improvement is only slight. Being Virginia Woolf, she can easily imagine another world. But being Virginia Woolf, she also knows reality. She thus concludes, so sir, if you want us to help you to prevent war, the conclusion seems to be inevitable. We must help to rebuild the college, which, imperfect as it may be, is the only alternative to the education of the private house. We must therefore, we, um, we must hope at that time that education may be altered, that guinea must be given before we give you a guinea that you ask for your own society. Let me just say here that by the time Virginia Woolf writes this, the guinea is an obsolete gold coin, but the upper class society still writes guineas in the forms of a check. So on the one hand, the guinea indicates her class, 
So she actually does have enough money to be the kind of writer that she is. She does have enough money that she can establish the Hogarth Press. But the guinea is also worth one pound, one shilling. So in that sense, it's not very much. So she can make both the point that she comes from a particular class, but even in this particular class, she doesn't actually have very much money to influence people. Having addressed the need for women's education, Wolf turns to the need for women's professions. Again, rather than giving a guinea to help the man society preventing war, she gives a guinea to a women's society promoting the employment of women. For, as she observes, to help women to earn their living in the professions is to help them possess that weapon of independent opinion, which is still their most powerful weapon. It is, the, it is to help them to have a mind of their own and a will of their own, which to help you prevent war. Wolf argues that women are already hard at work in society, but they are not properly remunerated or remunerated at all. She concludes that the civil service has been open since 1919 to women, but when she reviews salaries in Whitaker's Almanac, she sees that the women are circling in the lower spheres, barely eking out a living. And most women, she observes, are working at home, taking care of children, the elderly, and the sick, a profession for which they receive no income. She mockingly rebukes her country for paying women nothing for the profession that serves as the very foundation of society. The work of an archbishop is worth 15,000 pounds a year to the state. The work of a judge is worth 5,000 pounds a year. The work of a permanent secretary is worth 3,000 pounds a year. The work of an army captain, of a sea captain, of a sergeant of the dragoons, of a policeman, of a postman, all these works are worth paying for out of the taxes. But wives and mothers and daughters who work all day and every day, without whose work the state would collapse and fall to pieces, without whose work your sons, sir, would cease to exist, are paid nothing whatever. Can it be possible? Doubtful that the country will begin paying women to take care of family members at home, Wolf argues that women need to enter the professions. But she again recognizes the moral dilemma. When she watches the procession of professional men from her imagined bridge between the private and public spheres, she observes that the professions, quote, make the people who practice them possessive and jealous of any infringement of their rights and highly combative if anyone dares dispute them. When she points out this dilemma to the woman seeking funds for her society, the woman throws up her hands in exasperation. We, daughters of education men, are between the devil and the deep sea. Behind us lies the patriarchal system, the private home, with its nullity, its immorality, its hypocrisy, its servility. Before us lies the public world, the professional system, with its possessiveness, its jealousness, its pugnacity, its greed. The one shuts us up like slaves in a harem, the other forces us to circle like caterpillars, head to tail, round and round the mulberry tree, the sacred tree of property. It is a choice of evils. Each is bad. Had we not better plunge off the bridge into the river, give up the game, declare that the whole of human life is a mistake, and so end it? Although this strong language indicates the urgency of the moral dilemma, she is between the devil and the deep sea, Wolf advocates jumping in but not giving up the game. She simply wants women's work to promote everyone's well-being. She thus argues, you shall swear that you will do all in your power to insist that any woman who enters any profession shall in no way hinder any other human being, whether man or woman, white or black, provided that he or she is qualified to enter that profession from entering it. It shall do all in her power to help them. But Wolf also doubts that women will easily be corrupted since their training in the private sphere has taught them to be poor, to be chaste, to bear ridicule, and to be shut out. Cleverly and ironically, she turns these disadvantages into advantages. As long as women remember the training they have received at home, they will contribute to the workforce without breeding the competition and jealousy that drive men to war. In reminding women of their education at home, Wolf redefines the terms poverty and chastity to promote liberty. Woman must accept poverty, says Wolf, but by poverty, she means enough to be independent of any other human being and to buy that modicum of health, leisure, knowledge, and so on that is needed for the whole development of mind and body, but no more, not a penny more. By chaste, she means mentally honest, not physically pure. When you have enough money to live on by your profession, she insists, you must refuse to sell your brain for the sake of money. 
She also invites women to welcome criticism, which she knows they'll receive in abundance. Since ridicule, she says, obscurity and censure are preferable for psychological reasons to fame and praise. Directly badges, orders, or degrees are offered you, she advises, fling them back in the giver's face. Wolf also observes that women's extensive training and being shut out will come as an advantage in helping them keep free from what she terms unreal loyalties, that is, loyalties that pressure them to say and do things against their will. Confident that women's experience outside the public sphere will help them fight the injustices within it, and confident that the benefits of women's participation in the workforce will far outweigh its costs, she hands over her guinea with enthusiasm. Having promoted gender equality by giving money to a women's college and a women's employment agency, Wolf finally offers her a third guinea to the man who requested her money in the first place, the man wanting her to join his society for preventing war. After all, she says she too wants to protect the rights of the individual by opposing dictatorship, by ensuring the democratic ideals of equality for all. But Wolf illustrates her resistance to unreal loyalties when she refuses to sign the man's manifesto asking her to protect culture and intellectual liberty. She also promotes these ideals, of course, but she thinks women can protect their intellectually more fully by preserving a realm in which they can speak freely without being pressured by society. Wolf defines intellectual liberty as the right to say or write what you think in your own words and in your own way. And she knows she can say and write things more honestly as an outsider than an insider. She argues that women's different point of view must be preserved as a check to men's. Different we are, as facts have proved, both in sex and education. And it is from that difference, as we have already said, that our help can come, if help we can, to protect liberty, to prevent war. But if we sign this form, which implies a promise to become active members of your society, it would seem that we must lose that difference and therefore sacrifice that help. She proposes instead what she terms an outsider society, a collection of people resisting personally and privately the status quo. In speaking her mind, Wolf illustrates her membership in the outsider society throughout her essay, but she especially employs her status as an outsider when she takes on the Anglican church. The church, she argues, is only one institution that promotes inequality, but she offers it as, quote, the type of all professions, since people regard it, ostensibly, as the highest and most important. It is also an institution that everyone can evaluate, since everyone can read the Bible. What the Christian religion is has been laid down once and for all by the founder of that religion in words that can be read by all in a translation of singular beauty. And whether or not we accept the interpretation that is put, put on them, we cannot deny them to be words of the most profound meaning. But if in one sense Christianity is open to all, in another it is open only to men. She takes the Archbishop's Commission on the Ministry of Women, published in 1936, as a case in point. The commission, she notes, was established in response to a group of women requesting entrance into the priesthood in 1935. What Wolf observes when speaking freely about this report is utter nonsense. The commission concludes, for instance, that women cannot be allowed to minister church services because the men will be too distracted. The commission says, the ministrations of a male priesthood do not normally arouse that side of female human nature, which should be quiescent during the times of the adoration of the Almighty God. We believe, on the other hand, that it would be impossible for the male members of the average Anglican congregation to be present at a service at which a woman ministered without becoming unduly conscious of her sex. Wolf retorts scathingly, in the opinion of the commissioners, therefore, Christian women are more spiritually minded than Christian men. A remarkable, but no doubt adequate, reason for excluding them from the priesthood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when she analyzes the commissioner's reading of the Bible, she regards their reasoning as even more troubling. In consulting the New Testament, the commission concedes that Christ himself called both men and women to minister. The report concludes, 
The Gospels show us the Gospels show us that our Lord required men and women alike as members of the same spiritual kingdom, as children of God's family, and as possessors of the same spiritual capacities. In proof of this, observes Bolt, they quote Galatians 3.28. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Jesus Christ. But this fact does not invite the commissioners themselves to accept both men and women into the priesthood. And in considering their rationale for keeping women out, Wolf exposes the mental shenanigans that, women, that men go to to keep power in the hands of men. How then can women be excluded from the priesthood since they were thought fit by the founder of the religion and by one of the apostles to preach, she asks. That was the question. And the commission solved it by appealing not to the mind of the founder, but to the mind of the church. That, of course, involved a distinction. For the mind of the church had to be interpreted by another mind, and that mind was St. Paul's mind, and St. Paul, in interpreting the other mind, changed his own mind. For after summoning from the depths of the past certain venerable, if obscure figures, Lydia and Chloe, Eudia and Syntyche, Tryphena and Tryphosa and Persis, debating their status and deciding what was the difference between a prophetess and a presbyteress, what the standing of a deaconess in the pre-Nicene church and what in the post-Nicene church, the commissioners once more have recourse to St. Paul and say, in any case, it is clear that the author of the pastoral epistles, be he St. Paul or another, regarded women as being debarred on the ground of her sex from the position of an official teacher in the church or from any office involving the exercise of a governmental authority over a man, 1 Timothy 2.12. By exposing the contradictions and qualifications in the commissioner's line of reasoning, Wolf shows that it is anything but clear that women should be excluded from the priesthood. She also shows that the commission offers biblical grounds for including women in the priesthood, but they narrow reading, their reading to keep women out. To shed further light on men's reasoning, Wolf turns to psychology to expose men's irrational justifications for keeping women out of the priesthood. The commission, she explains, hired Professor Renstead from Oxford University, a professor of the philosophy of Christianity, to summarize the relevant psychological and physiological material pertaining to women's participation in the priesthood. Renstead concludes, however, that men have no rational grounds for denying women access. He admits that psychologists fully recognize the fact of male dominance, but this must not be confused with male superiority, still less with any type of precedent which could have a bearing upon questions as to the admissibility of one sex rather than the other in holy orders. In fact, he reports that psychologists regard men's re resistance as a symbol of their own fear of losing power. This strength of feeling conjoined with a wide variety of rational explanations, it's clear evidence of the presence of powerful and widespread subconscious motives. In the absence of detailed analytic material of which there seems to be no record in this particular connection, it nevertheless remains clear that infantile fixation plays a predominant part in determining the strong emotion with which this whole subject is commonly approached. Men's decision to shut women out of the ministry, he concludes, cannot be regarded in any other light than as a non-rational sex taboo. In examining the church's report, Wolf reveals the startling fact that facts do little to alter the church's stance regarding women's participation in the priesthood. She herself thus resists participation, remaining on the outside, even as she hopes that women will someday be on the inside. We, who now agitate these humble pens, may, in another century or so, speak from the pulpit. Ultimately, Wolf argues that women must resist inequality by working both inside and outside systems of power. By offering her guineas to a women's college and a women's employment agency, Wolf encourages women to gain the expertise they need to work in the public sphere. But by giving, inviting women into her outsider society, she also encourages them to resist the corrupting influence of power by speaking out and living differently. Paradoxically then, she wants women and people in general to simultaneously share and resist power. The aim, she concludes, quoting Joseph Amin Butler, a 19th century advocate of women's education, is to assert the rights of all, all men and women, to the respect in their persons of the great principles of justice, equality, and liberty. Wolf also shares and resists power in writing her political argument in the form of a letter. She joins the long debate about liberty, but she resists the philosophical tradition of the Enlightenment which is dominated by men, 
by embracing the female traditions of letter writing in the epistolary novel, which is a novel written in the form of letters. In writing her own epistle that promotes women, she also opposes Paul's epistles, which have been used by patriarchal society to demote women. Amusingly, she even alludes to the Socratic tradition. After all, the letter is a dialogue that begins with the question, how, in your opinion, are we to prevent war? But she allows her mayor, male interlocutor only one question, and she holds forth for 200 pages herself. She thus participates in the literary and philosophical traditions in numerous ways, but also remains outside of them, calling them into question. When James Baldwin examines inequality in America a decade after Wolfe considers the problem in England, he too speaks as an outsider who assumes the responsibility of holding the dominant power accountable for its ignorance and crimes. In his essay, Stranger in the Village, published in 1953, Baldwin argues that white people maintain their sense of superiority only by denying their own brutality. The white man prefers to keep the black man at a certain human remove because it is easier for him thus to preserve his simplicity and avoid being calling to account for crimes committed by his forefathers or his neighbors. But even if whites preferred to keep blacks at a distance, Baldwin argues that whites in America have difficulty doing so. The relationship between blacks and whites in America is unique, he argues, because American slavery took place on American soil. In contrast, Europe's black possessions remained and do remain, he says, in Europe's colonies, at which remove they presented no threat whatever to European identity. In close proximity to blacks, whites see constant evidence of both blacks' humanity and their own inhumanity. To claim superiority in the face of these facts, he says, whites have used such tortured reasoning and such torturous methods as to illustrate their own psychosis. The idea of white supremacy rests simply on the fact that white men are the creators of civilization. The present civilization, which is the only one that matters, all previous, previous civilizations are simply contributions to our own and are therefore civilization's guardians and defenders. Thus, it was impossible for Americans to accept the black man as one of themselves, for to do so was to jeopardize their status as white men. But not so to accept him was to, condone, to deny his human reality his human weight and complexity, and the strain of denying the overwhelmingly undeniable forced Americans into rationalizations so fantastic that they approached the pathological. A central component of this pathology, Baldwin argues, is repression. White Americans have trained themselves to repress reality because they have spent 300 years denying their cruelty to black people. Americans are as in, unlike any other white people in the world as it is possible to be. I do not think, for example, that it is too much to suggest that the American vision of the world, which allows so little reality, generally speaking, for any of the darker forces in human life, which tends until today to paint moral issues in glaring black and white, owes a great deal to the battle waged by Americans to maintain between themselves and black men a human separation which could not be bridged. Baldwin warns that if white people continue to deny blacks their humanity, the cost will be their own destruction. It is now only beginning to be born on us, very faintly it must be admitted, very slowly and very much against our will, that this vision of the world is dangerously inaccurate and perfectly useless, for it protects our moral high-mindedness at the terrible expense of weakening our grasp of reality. People who shut their eyes to reality simply invite their own destruction. And anyone who insists on remaining in a state of innocence long after that innocence is dead turns himself into a monster. Even as Baldwin claims that White's denial of reality is pathological and monstrous, he also paradoxically regards this pathology as a sign of hope. At some level, he suggests, White people know that their view of reality is false. They would not be so pathological if they were not so uncomfortable. Americans, he says, have made themselves notorious by the thrillness and brutality with which they have insisted on the idea of white superiority, but they did not invent it. And it has escaped the world's notice that those very excesses of which Americans have been guilty 
imply a certain unprecedented uneasiness over the idea's life and power, if not indeed the idea's validity. As is often the case with Baldwin, he finds hope where others might miss it. An unprecedented easiness is promising. In fact, at the end of his essay, Baldwin argues that the world can learn a valuable lesson from the history of racial struggle in America. One of the things that distinguishes American from other people is that no other people has ever been so deeply involved in the lives of black men and vice versa. This fact faced with all its implications, it can be seen that the history of the American Negro problem is not merely shameful, it is also something of an achievement. For even when the worst has been said, it must also be added that the perpetual challenge posed by this problem was always somehow perpetually met. It is precisely this black-white experience which may prove of indispensable value to us and the world we face today. This world is white no longer, and it will never be white again. Even if Baldwin is hopeful here, he's also careful lest white people feel a tinge of pride to insist that the advantage of the American experience comes from the erosion of white power. After all, this world is white no longer, and it will never be white again. He's also careful to insist that America's work is never done. The essay is a call for constant resistance to injustice. The problem is perpetual, and therefore must be perpetually challenged. Baldwin's rhetorical strategy in Stranger in the Village is similar to Wolf's in Three Guineas. He exposes the absurdity of White's justifications of power just as she exposes the absurdity of men's. She also undermine, he also undermines that power by working to empower blacks as she works to empower women. Moreover, he writes the essay from Switzerland where his status as a stranger and outsider invites him to speak his mind freely about America. Writing outside of America, he gets into America's head. But Wolf and Baldwin fight injustice not only by attacking those in power, but also by telling stories that raise up those who are disempowered. And in raising people up, they serve as models of justice. In his essay, Notes of a Native Son, published in 1955, Baldwin counters injustice by helping people better understand the cause of race riots. He invites sympathy for black rioters in Harlem by first telling a story about his relationship with his father. The essay begins, by referring to his father's death, but also by acknowledging the overwhelming obstacles for black Americans in the middle of the century. On the 29th of July in 1943, my father died. On the same day, a few hours later, his last child was born. Over a month before this, while all our energies were concentrated in waiting for these events, there had been, in Detroit, one of the bloodiest race riots of the century. A few hours after my father's funeral, while he lay in state in the Undertaker's Chapel, a race riot broke out in Harlem. On the morning of the 3rd of August, we drove my father to the graveyard through a wilderness of smashed plate glass. The number of problems that Baldwin faces is daunting, especially for a young man. The day of his father's funeral is also his 19th birthday. The death, birth, and riot that he experiences personally symbolize the larger forces at work in the country. The war that concerns Baldwin in 1943 is not the one that prompts Wolfe to write Three Guineas, but the one waged between blacks and whites in America. This war, he argues, destroyed his father, and he laments his own failure to understand his father's struggle until after his death. Barred from the opportunities of the country, his father became increasingly bitter and increasingly estranged from his family. He claimed to be proud of his blackness, but it had always been the cause of much humiliation and it had fixed bleak boundaries to his life. He was not a young man when we were growing up and he had already suffered many kinds of ruin. In his outrageously demanding and protective way, he loved his children who were black like him and menaced like him and all these things sometimes showed in his face when he tried, never to my knowledge with any success, to establish contact with any of us. Exemplifying the severity of his father's estrangement, Baldwin admits, tragically, I do not remember in all those years that one of his children was ever glad to see him come home. 
It isn't until he leaves Harlem and starts working in New Jersey that Baldwin begins to understand the racism, racism that destroyed his father. Experiencing it firsthand, he finds that he can do nothing to resist White's automatic rejection of him as a black man. I learned in New Jersey that to be a Negro meant precisely that one was never looked at but was simply at the mercy of the reflexes the color of one's skin caused in other people. And White's reflexes, signaling their aggression, instinctively prompt his own physiological response, which he describes as a chronic disease that can be never cured but only managed. That year in New Jersey lives in my mind as though it were the year during which, having an unsuspected predilection for it, I first contact, contracted some dread chronic disease, the unfailing symptom of which is a kind of blind fever, a pounding in the skull, and fire in the bowels. Once this disease is contracted, one can never be really carefree again, for the fever, without an instant's warning, can recur at any moment. It can wreck more important things than race relations. There is not a Negro alive who does not have this rage in his blood. One has the choice merely of living with it consciously or surrendering to it. As for me, this fever has recurred in me and does and will until the day I die. He illustrates this disease by admitting that in a restaurant one evening, after he has been denied service, he hurls a mug at a waitress. The thing that sets him off is the waitress's reflexive statement we don't serve Negroes here. Though he misses hitting her, he, immediately, he is immediately pursued and narrowly escapes. His rage terrifies him and reveals his vulnerability. I saw nothing very clearly, he states, but I did see this, that my life, my real life, was in danger, and not from anything other people might do, but from the hatred I carried in my own heart. Bearing this burden of hatred himself, he begins to understand his father's bitterness and also the rage that sparks the race riot in Harlem. When he stands on the street after the riot and observes the destruction, he acknowledges the riot's futility, but also its necessity. One's first incongruous impression of plenty was encountered immediately by an impression of waste. None of this was doing anybody any good. It would have been better to have left the plate glass as it had been and the goods lying in the stores. It would have been better, but it would also have been intolerable. For Harlem had needed something to smash. To smash something is the ghetto's chronic need. Most of the time, it is the members of the ghetto who smash each other and themselves, but as long as the ghetto walls are standing, there will always come a moment when these outlets do not work. Understanding the intolerable conditions of the ghetto, he understands the rioter's rage. He doubts whether the riot does anybody any good, but he also acknowledges that the rioters have no other recourse. He therefore serves as the recourse, using the outlet of his essay to express the community's fury. Speaking on behalf of the rioters, he refuses to let their justifiable fury go to waste. He also refuses to let his father's life go to waste. At the end of his essay, he returns to the morning of his father's funeral and admits that he initially failed to understand the race riot. That bleakly memorable morning, I hated the unbelievable streets and the Negroes and whites who had equally made them that way. But he also imagines his father's critique of this hatred. As my father would have said, this bitterness was folly. Although this wisdom had no power to save his father, it helps Baldwin himself. His father's wisdom inspires his own profound and paradoxical statement regarding our responsibility to fight injustice. It began to seem that one would have to hold the mind forever two ideas which seemed to be in opposition. The first idea was acceptance. The acceptance totally without rancor of life as it is and men as they are. In the light of this idea, it goes without saying that injustice is a commonplace. But this did not mean that one could be complacent, for the second idea was of equal power, that one must never, in one's own life, accept these injustices as a commonplace, but must fight them with all one's strength. Here, like Wolf, Baldwin works both inside and outside the forces of injustice that threaten to destroy him. In accepting the fact of injustice, he avoids being overcome, 
but in rejecting the existence of just injustice, he avoids being complacent. In short, he stays alive to fight. The final injustice that Baldwin fights in the essay is his youthful misunderstanding of his father. While the beginning of the essay recalls their estrangement when Baldwin says not one of his children was ever glad to see him come home, in the last two sentences of the essay, he welcomes him. The fight for justice, he realizes, begins in the heart. And it now had been laid to my charge to keep my own heart free of hatred and despair. This intimation made my heart heavy, and now that my father was irrecoverable, I wished that he had been beside me so that I could have searched his face for the answers which only the future would give me now. But the essay does recover his father, and it places the father and son side by side. In examining his father's life and the history of America, the essay searches his father's face and provides the answers that bring them back together. Baldwin accepts his father with an without rancor and embraces him. Ultimately, Baldwin uses the outlet of writing to both disempower the insider and empower the outsider. Stranger in the Village and Notes of a Native Son were both published in Harper's Monthly, the oldest monthly journal periodical in America with a readership in the 1950s that was largely white. In writing for this audience, he works to dispel the ignorance that threatens to destroy the country. But as a writer, he also controls the narrative. He insists on portraying his father, himself, and the Harlem riot rioters in a rich and nuanced way. In educating white people, he thus counters the injustice that he witnessed while living in New Jersey as a young man. There, he observed that one was never looked at but was simply at the mercy of the reflexes the color of one's skin caused in other people. But as a writer, he makes people look, both to undermine the ignorance of the insiders and to lift the outsiders up. Wolf too celebrates outsiders. Her last novel, Between the Acts, which was published after her death in 1941, offers a particularly poignant example. Although Wolfe takes patriarchal Christianity to task in Three Guineas, in between the acts, she honors the personal, private religion of the elderly widow, Mrs. Lucy Swithin. Dismissed by those around her, Lucy is called variously batty, flimsy, foolish, and an old fogey. Her brother Bartholomew regards her as scatterbrained, admitting that she would be a very clever woman had she fixed her gaze, but this led to that, that to the other, one thing went in this year, went out that. He especially mocks her for being religious. In spite of his disapproval, however, she practices her faith, though uneasily. Early in the novel, Bart and Lucy's discussion about the weather reveals their disagreement about religion. She is worried about rain since they are holding an annual pageant on the grounds of their country estate. It's very unsettled. It'll rain, I'm afraid. We can only pray, she added, and fingered her crucifix, and provide umbrellas, said her brother. Lucy flushed. He had struck her faith. When she said pray, he added umbrellas. She half covered the cross with her fingers. Lucy's nervous fingering of her cross suggests a desire to protect herself against her brother and to maintain her identity. But while her relatives and friends dismiss her, Wolf recognizes her gifts. Mrs. Swithin sees the good in people that they fail to recognize themselves. She reveals her generous spirit when, in thinking about the amateur cast of the pageant, she pronounces, people are gifted, very. The question is how to bring it out. One character she brings out is a man whom others dismiss because he is gay, William Dodge. While several of her relatives and guests are waiting for the play, she invites him into the house for a tour, a gesture that symbolizes her acceptance and hospitality. She takes him upstairs and shows him the rooms. In one bedroom, she informs him that this is the place where she was born. Remembering her birth, Mrs. Swithin recognizes her age, but she buoys their spirits before the specter of death. But we have other lives, I think. I hope, she murmurs. We live in others, Mr. We live in things. 
Although she forgets her, his name, Dodge knows that she understands him. He also recognizes that she is more generous than he is. She had spoken her thoughts, ignoring, not caring if he thought her as he had, inconsequent, sentimental, foolish. She had lent him a hand to help him up a steep place. She had guessed his trouble. In extending hospitality to Dodge, Lucy gives him the courage to declare himself. When she forgets his name again, he asserts, I'm William. And her radiant response lends him grace. At that, she smiled a ravishing girl's smile, as if the wind had warmed the wintry blue in her eyes to amber. She can't easily explain to William why she brought him into the house. I took you, she apologized, away from your friends, William, because I felt wound tight here. Yet William acknowledges that her gesture redeems him, even though he doesn't say so out loud. He saw her eyes only, and he wished to kneel before her, to kiss her hand, and to say, at school, they held me under a bucket of dirty water, Mrs. Swiven. When I looked up, the world was dirty, Mrs. Swiven, but you've healed me. So he wished to say, but said nothing, and the breeze went walloping along the corridors, blowing out the blinds. With no response from William, Lucy grows doubtful. In the moment of silence, they look out the window, and she questions her religion. Once more, he looked, and she looked down on the yellow gravel that made a crescent round the door. Pendant from her chain, her cross swung, and she went out, and the sun struck it. How could she weight herself down by that sleek symbol? How stamp herself, so volatile, so vagrant with that image? Though Mrs. Swithin doubts her faith, Wolf confirms, Wolf confirms the beauty of her Christianity. Her receptiveness to the cross symbolizes her receptiveness to others. It is because she is vagrant and doubting that she recognizes other vagrants and doubters. The cross may weigh her down, but she lightens the load of others. Lucy Swithin's cross, swinging from her neck as she looks out the window, recalls and opposes the jeweled crucifix that swings on the breast of the archbishop in Wolfe's imagined male procession in Three Guineas. Men's public display of power, Wolfe suggests, pales in comparison to the power of Lucy's private, flickering faith. She is the one who grants William Dodge his humanity. She is the one who ministers effectively in the spirit of Christ. Between the acts of state, Wolfe suggests, between the acts of those in power are the quiet acts of outsiders like Mrs. Swithin, outsiders who grant grace to others by inviting them inside. Wolfe and Baldwin remind me of the promise of our own mission as an institution. Through Mrs. Swithin, Wolfe insists that people are gifted, very. The question is how to bring it out. Baldwin searches his father's face for answers which only the future will bring. We proclaim in our mission statement that every person is created in the image of God as a being of inestimable value and worth, imbued with powers of intelligence, stewardship, and creativity akin to those of the creator. Wolf, Wolf and Baldwin are counting on all of us, or hoping at least, that we will promote this mission in the pursuit of justice and equality, recognizing people's value and worth in the spirit of Wolf, Baldwin, and the Creator then. Let us celebrate each other's gifts and let's get to work. lecture to another. <laughs> now the door has been opened just a little bit for those of you who have not had the pleasure 
of uh, Kelly as a colleague or Dr. Bond as your professor, uh, the careful and thoughtful uh, analysis of, uh, of text. And uh, as is often the case in her classes or in conversations with colleagues, uh, the ideas are also provocative. And we have a few minutes uh, to have a conversation with her. Now, I know that some of you uh, may be wanting to leave uh, during this time. Please do so quietly. For those of you who are worried about community, you checked in. You don't have to worry about checking out. They will uh, do that by hand. That's what I've been informed. Uh, who knows if that's true? If there are questions, we do have uh, roving microphones, uh, Dan Lamberton on that side, Bob Cushman on this side. Are there questions? Stand up if you have a question. <laughs> or not. Okay. Is it on? I think so. Let's see. Is it on? Yeah. Okay, so Kelly, I like results. Did either one of these people change the world in a very dramatic, uh, quick way so we don't have any uh, issues anymore? No, I think they are more prophetic in demonstrating that we always have to fight them. Yeah. They would argue, though, Tom that writing is an active tool. So that education, they believe, does change the world. Yeah. Kelly, I'll ask you a question. She had a, Wolf had a really remarkable family, people around her and different kinds of opinions and actions. And, and prejudices and so on, as did Baldwin. Did you feel any kind of um, mechanism in, in their hope toward working from family to institution to government? There had to be some kind of, I, and I'm asking this question because of the fact that we are a kind of, a particular kind of family. We are an institution, we're small. Um, is there, something in her letters, in, their, in his letters, that said where, where we start? Mm -hmm. Well, I do think that they start by paying close attention to the people around them. So I think that those remarkable families, mm -hmm. <laughs> in some sense, really teach them the microcosm that is the larger world. And both of them theorize that, especially Wolf, just because he argues that it's in that private sphere that we actually understand what's happening in the public sphere, and she argues that those two can't be split. They have to be seen as representative of each other. Yeah. She does use the house as a, as a emblem of oppression in some places. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know whether or not she thought that was the place to begin or the place to give up on. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Your tension there between the insider-outsider, Kelly, is intriguing because Seventh-day Adventism is technically in terms of the mainstream culture, we are outsiders, we're countercultural. So how would you say that those of us who are part of this outsider culture should, uh, how should we place ourselves so that we can make a difference for good? Well, I think that and regarding ourselves as peculiar, right? I mean, we have all the, we've been trained in some of the ways that she says women were trained, right? We're, we're in, we have this heritage of, of being embarrassed. <laughs> and to some extent, right, we have the heritage of knowing that others don't necessarily regard us as mainstream, even if we might call ourselves mainstream. Uh, I think some of us probably need to actually, actually operate inside society, <laughs> perhaps more than out. But I think that our church changes its position in that sense. But I think that her philosophy 
in some ways places it is in a position where, you know, if we're used to seeing ourselves as outside, in some ways that can be an advantage, but it shouldn't keep us only outside. Yeah. How do you think that their opinions would um, change or stay the same if they were present now? And would they, see, would they see successes in each of these causes, or would they? Um... Baldwin, actually, I can speak to that a little bit more specifically with him, probably, because he, the two essays that I was looking at today are in the book's Notes of a Native Son, which he publishes in a new edition in about um, 84. So he dies in 87, so it's pretty late in his career. And he's actually much darker and much... Um, more pessimistic in the introduction to that particular text. So I think, you know, he, and I think that's serious for him, but I also think it's rhetorically necessary for him because he says basically white people have lied and they have argued that they're going to change and they haven't changed. And therefore, he's actually more frustrated in some sense at the end of his life than he is in 1965 when, when he reads that. I think that, you know, it's not until the 1970s that, that Oxford and Cambridge opened fully for women, so that's certainly progress. <laughs> I think that for Wolf, interestingly, because I talked about the, you know, her frustration with, well, if you're going to argue that women need to be in the home, then it only logically follows that you'll need to pay them. Um, but she also argues that, and she actually does this in a footnote, so it's not the major part of the text, but she argues that, you know, ideally, everyone would work better if the men were home half as much and if the women were in the workplace half as much. So, you know, she actually is addressing pretty early those issues that we address commonly now. But I think that for a wolf, until you have equal representation in all the powerful institutions, which would be the church, which would be the state, which would be both houses of the legislator, which would be both parties of both houses of the legislator, <laughs> which would be the corporate world, which would be the world of education, which would be the world of home. There's still work to do. And we have a ways to go. <laughs> um, yes, I have a question. Uh, in t today's uh, society, we have uh, a group called Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And um, it's arised from all the, the social injustices that happened to black um, youth. And, um, of course, their their statement is "Black Lives Matter," um, but they're facing opposition, saying all lives matter. There's some some groups are saying that um, that uh, their 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 message is narrow-minded and disorganized. Um, what do you think, Baldwin, or how do you think he will address this, and what side would he take on this? Um, this I issue? was I was thinking about that very issue actually when I was um, writing about Notes of a Native Son, because. I think it's demonstrative for him that black lives matter, right? That he wants to, and I was somewhat hesitant to say, because even though I think that he really does want to educate a white audience, to some extent, that's not his central issue, right? His central issue in that essay is actually understanding the rioters and understanding his father. So I actually think it's specifically an argument for that. And I think that his later, his later statements make that argument too. But these essays, I think, demonstrate that. Um, so you're arguing that their status as outsiders helps them to fight oppression, but I noticed that Virginia Woolf stays in London in the home um, writing, whereas Baldwin moves outside of America. Do you think that that physical um, separation is significant in his main, um, maintenance of outsiders? He argues that it is, right. And I think, you know, to some extent he exiles himself. Um, and that's certainly a very physical representation of being outside so that he can actually, I think, have the wherewithal and not be overcome <laughs> to actually address and write about the problems. So he comes back to America several times, but he doesn't stay for very long. And he argues that it's difficult to stay here, that he has an easier time thinking about here, and easy, he has an easier time, I think, maintaining his American identity, ironically, if he actually isn't here. With Wolf, I actually think that issue pertains too because she drowned herself, so she killed herself. And um, knowing that, and she did it by walking into a river. So 
when I think about that sentence in her la in Three Guineas, where she's, you know, thinking about the um, profession for society of, of women, and she says we're between, you know, we're the deep blue sea and the devil. And right then in that argument, you know, she she just jumps in and doesn't give up the game. But I always think about that sentence when I think about her deciding to remove herself in 1941, in World War II, and knowing that she and her husband, you know, would get captured and killed by the Nazis. And also, I think really having an incredible philosophical crisis about whether one can operate ethically in this world. And she removes herself from the world. But I also think in the last novel that I'm talking about, um, Between the Acts, there are so many ways in which you can read that novel. And remember what Mrs. Swithin says. She says that we live in others, we live in things. And I think that she's really making an argument there that her philosophy is that this world is unified. And she's pretty confident that other people will take up her cause. So it's interesting at the end of that play, too, because modernism is famous for writing difficult texts and for being somewhat skeptical of a reading and an audience being able to understand how difficult something is. And this play that's performed is this really difficult play to follow. Everyone keeps on looking at their programs because they don't know what the play's about. And they have to keep on saying, oh, it's the Elizabethan age, or oh, it's the Victorian age. So no one knows what's going on really in the play. but. The audience sells really smart things, right? So they, they, they keep on saying, oh, we each have our part to play. Or, oh, I think she means, you know, we're all important. <laughs> and it's just this delightful last scene of Virginia Woolf's fiction because you can tell that, you know, there are these just common people and they have lots of stupid things to say, but then they have lots of wonderful things to say. And I think that she thinks, you know, she's satisfied at least. It's not just, I think she, do, I think she does have a mental crisis. But I think, thinking about that last novel, she also, you know, she is in some sense optimistic about other people, but she's also optimistic that her work is alive, right? I mean, a writer's work is always here. The writer is not dead. So for Wolf, you know, she can go into the river in some sense and be outside, but her whole corpus, which in some sense we've only begun to study, <laughs> is here for a long time. Yeah, so she's on the inside. She's here. <laughs> Use mine. Um, understanding that Baldwin removed himself from um, essentially the society he was raised up in, and then Virginia Woolf staying within her society, um, understanding their um, their natural inclination to be actually outside of their own society. Would their analysis change at all if, say, Baldwin stayed within New York um, and then Virginia Woolf decidedly left London and, I guess, went to France or Switzerland? And, and uh -huh. Yeah, well, I, Woolf was certainly well-traveled, so she was part of this very international debate. I think with, you know, with Baldwin, I think that he feels that he can do more work away, um, partly because he doesn't become overwhelmed. <laughs> Um, so he's still certainly active. I think that he's certainly always active here, even if he's not living here. So I think with him, he would have a harder time if he had been living here to what he says. You know, he, he actually, he makes a clear distinction between rage and anger and hatred and bitterness. Right? And rage and anger, he argues, can be directed in a particular way and can be useful. But bitterness and hatred, he argues, overwhelm a person. Right? So he argues, I cannot do the work I need to do if I'm bitter or if I'm full of hate. And so he places him, himself in a position in the world where he feels like he can be most ethical and most philosophical and you know, most contribute the most. Yeah. Thanks, Kelly, for your talk tonight. It was so interesting. I'm over here. Hi, Emily. Um, hi. <laughs> Um, one, one of the things I'm noticing about Baldwin and Wolf, and I'm not super duper familiar with both of them, but that they, they seem to be capable of disruption. They may not have, as, as Tom asked for, created lots of immediate change, but they seem to be capable of disrupting power. 
and they used their rhetoric to do that, and they were fairly disruptive within their disciplines. They changed what, the way writing was looked at. They changed things. As you look at power now and you look at rhetoric now, um, are you seeing any disrupt disruptions, any ways of being disruptive in rhetoric, like Twitter or other forms of outsiders maybe gaining access, changing the, discu the, 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 the discussion some? I certainly think that's the case. I am, so, you know, I am not, um, I am a poor presence in the digital world. <laughs> Let's just say that. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I was thinking about this while writing this paper too. I don't think that the change would have come as quickly for gay rights if it hadn't been for the digital world. I mean, I think seeing everyone's personal stories, and I think this proves, this gets back to your point, Tom, too. Look at reading people's stories and having people ex tell their experiences changes the way in which we respond to people. And I think that that's a good example of where that has really worked. Um, I would also say, you know, I think that they demonstrate, well, certainly Wolf and Baldwin, and especially Baldwin always demonstrates disruption any time typically that any of us talk about him or teach about teaching in class just because he gets under people's skin and people get mad. And as long as people get mad, <laughs> that demonstrates that he's still working in some sense and that the work still actually needs to get done. So, and I think that most writers still have that. I mean, you know, most writers I'm studying <laughs> still make people mad. <laughs> yeah. There's one more over there. Okay. So for social justice movements to be successful, they often need to have outsiders or press populations who are able to align themselves with people of power to to make the change occur, right? So did either of them use these techniques or were they really disruptive to the end? No, I think that's part of the reason why they were so powerful, that they were, they, they, um, Baldwin especially, because we have to think about how he positioned himself in the civil rights movement. So he, in many ways, might strike us as radical, and he was radical, but in many, many ways he was not as radical as numerous other people. And so that made people go to him rather than to other people. There's an interesting moment in um, The Fire Next Time, you might remember this, where he goes to Elijah Muhammad's house and he's really uncomfortable because he feels like Elijah Muhammad, who's the director of the Nation of Islam, is just trying to indoctrinate him. And he keeps on pressuring James Baldwin to talk about his religious experience and Baldwin keeps on talking, you know, um, resisting. And, and Muhammad asks, well, what are you now? And he hesitates and he says, well, um, I'm, as far as religiously, he says, I'm not anything. And he says, he wasn't satisfied with that answer. He says, oh, I'm a writer. So he said, right. So that, he knows that that's going to be, that is his tool. I mean, in, in Notes of a Native Son, when he's thinking about the writers, and he's, you know, that the out, that the vent that they have, he, he knows he can use that, and he's published widely. And Virginia Woolf, first of all, she writes for the Times Literary Supplement. So, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reviewer, reviews. Um, it's also the case that her class standing helps her. And she knows that. And, she, and I, I mean, we, we, we can certainly call her into question about that, but she also uses it. So, you know, her family is from a line of publishers. Her father, you know, she knows all of these people. And it's also important to recognize that she establishes her own press, which she can do. That's handy for a person who wants to make the kind of radical statements that she makes. All right, thank you once again, Kelly, and give her a round of applause. I invite you to remain standing for prayer. We thank you tonight, God, for the scholarly gifts that you have given us and are displayed in Dr. Bond's presentation, gifts that were nurtured here at Walla Walla University when she was first an undergraduate student many years ago and now that have blossomed into nice 
distinguished faculty lecture. For more than a celebration, may her words remind us of the tragic nature of our broken world, a world where humans have oppressed fellow human beings on the basis of gender and race, and often in the name of God. May we stand for equality and injustice, empowering others and resisting all forms of power that stand in opposition to your plans for this world. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to uh, partake of the reception in the uh, foyer out front, and have a great night. <laughs>